Green Mile has been part of our consciousness for thousands of years, if not older. He was rediscovered again in the 1970s when somebody began to look up at churches and wonder, who is this man surrounded in foliage and what is he doing in a church? And it wasn't until that time really that anybody had paid particular attention to him. And they rediscovered him and they found his name he was quite old and he has been known for millennia as the Green Man. Some might say that his reappearance at that time was part of the rising consciousness of what people would call the environmental movement or what Lovelock called Gaia consciousness. And it seemed pertinent that people were looking to paganism and looking to a conscious connection with nature and with the planet around us. And suddenly he reappeared again, this figure of the green worm. You might argue we never lost him, he's always been part of our folklore. He is the wild man of the woods, he is Robin Goodfell. Perhaps we saw a dilemma on a scale never seen before of loss of woodlands and hedgerows and natural wild places. And yet again people began to long for the past where man lived in harmony with nature, not farming and not controlling nature, but being dependent on it. The woodland and the forests have been our home for millennia. It was said that once all of England was covered in trees and thick forests, and yet today there are hardly any pockets left. And I think this is why we reach out and he calls to us again from behind the trees and in the woodlands. And sometimes as you sit here, you catch a glimpse out of the corner of your eye of something moving. And you wonder, was it your imagination, or was it the Lord of the Woods? strange being. He is part man and part tree. He isn't simply surrounded by foliage or hiding in the leaves. He is the leaves. He breathes out the leaves. He consumes the leaves. The leaves arise from his mouth and his nose. He has an ecstatic look on his face. His is the wild ecstasy and the trance of the untamed god of nature. Although tales have come down to us as folklore, We've often trivialised this character. We've seen him as Robin Hood or Robin Goodfellow or Puck. And we've just dismissed this as little tales for children. When in fact this god is unsinkable. He is forever with us. He cannot die. In fact he will always reappear at the leaves in spring. The tales of Robin Hood are part myth and part history. In fact, he has blended the two, become a legend, and whereas he may have been based on historical facts, he is named in places like the Forest of Sherwood and Barnstone, 
and in Nottingham and in Locksley and many other places and actual towns. Many people want a bit of Robin Hood. Many people want to claim this character as their own hero, their own fighter of good against the evil of society. And the legend of the Puck or Brownie or Robin Goodfellow who lives in the woodlands and plays tricks on travellers. He is a hero too, for he pokes fun of society and he takes away the seriousness of life. The wealthy, the well-to-do, the people who consider themselves quite high in society may not have actual good manners, may not be worthy people. And so they will be at the butt of the trick of the trickster. And rightly so, for he represents natural justice in the face of society's hypocrisy. So the question remains, who is this wild god? And why is his face so often carved into churches? Could it be that the Christian church, while espousing all things God, actually embraced this pagan god? And why? Could it be that they saw in this vegetation god, a god who is not too dissimilar to their own? The story of this Indo-European vegetation god has had a very long history indeed. He does in fact appear in the faces of many gods, many of whom we know are most famous, gods like Dionysus, but most famously perhaps we know him as Osiris. Now as we know, Osiris was dismembered and his parts scattered around the land. But through the magic of Isis, she found all his parts again and reassembled them, all except for the phallus. The phallus being his wand or staff, his virility, his kingliness. But Isis rescued this, she remade it, and with her magic, she actually managed to give birth to a son who was Horus, the hawk-headed god, the shaman god. The action of Osiris and Isis create the third being, which is the holy child. This is in fact the story of how the king ultimately must serve the goddess of the land. He dies for her, he sacrifices himself for her. He lives not for himself, but for the land in which he lives. The land upon which he reigns, he works for the land and the people, and he must be willing to be sacrificed for the good of that land. It was supposed that in its real kings enacted the sacrifice, but we now reenact it symbolically, and often we name this character John Bellicom. Jack 
and green as a sprite of woodland and meadow. In many places he is celebrated each year, such as in Hastings at Edinburgh, where men dress up head to toe in greenery and join the May Day celebrations parading through the town as Jack in the Green. This wooden sprite is mischievous and wild. He is part of the forest, he is the dryads, the trees, he is the beavers of the plants, he is nature in its masculine aspect. He is the lord of the trees, and in myth this has come down to us as the king of the greenwoods, perhaps symbolically tied to the figure of Herm Hunter, or to Canonus, who perhaps is another aspect of Canonus, or the horned god, the stag god of the wild hunt, or indeed of Odin, the leader of the wild hunt itself. So the green man is the ancient spirit of the forest, and today we have reclaimed him again. Perhaps we're in need of this man to protect us, to be our hero. But perhaps as old churches seem to indicate, the green man could never really die. He would always rise again and be resurrected in the spring, like the leaves on the trees. <laughs> 